following program is a production of the Fairfax Network, Fairfax County Public Schools, funded in part by the Virginia Satellite Educational Network. This program was made possible through generous support from the Donald W. Reynolds Foundation to George Washington's Mount Vernon Estate and Gardens. Seed to Table is a co-production of the Fairfax Network and George Washington's Mount Vernon Estate and Gardens. Hello and welcome to Seed to Table. I'm Kate Sullivan and I'll be your host today. In the next half hour, we'll present information on farming at Mount Vernon. And we'll answer questions from students in our audience as well as those watching in classrooms across the country. George Washington is widely known for his leadership as a general and as our first president. But you, did you know that his first love was working on and improving his land? Washington was a successful farmer, and like other planters of that's his time, he relied heavily on enslaved labor to farm his estate. To learn more about the contribution of the enslaved community, students from Fairfax County Public Schools recently visited Mount Vernon. Well, good morning, students. Good morning. Thank you so much for visiting with us here today at Mount Vernon. Now, as I said, you're here at Mount Vernon, but just take a look around you. What exactly are we standing on right now? We are on a farm. We are on a farm. Now, did you know that George Washington was a farmer? Yes. Yes, he was a farmer. As a matter of fact, George Washington loved farming. That was his very greatest passion. That was his career. That's what he did throughout his lifetime. Now, we know Washington had about 8,000 acres of land. That's a lot of land. Think about it, 8,000 football fields. That's probably what an acre would have been. That's a lot of land, it sure was. Now he had four farms on all of that land. Now he grew a lot of different crops on those four different farms. Now tell me, what kinds of crops do you think George Washington would have grown? Yeah. Corn. Corn, exactly. Um, tobacco. Tobacco, he sure did grow tobacco. That was his first crop. And then he later switched to wheat. Now who do you think George Washington had here on his farms working his land? Yes. Slaves. He did have enslaved people who worked here at Mount Vernon. How many slaves were there? There were about 316 slaves in 1799 when George Washington died. Yes. Where did the slaves come from? Well, many of the slaves would have come originally from Africa, but by the time George Washington died, many of the slaves who lived here were the grandchildren and great-grandchildren of the original Africans who uh, worked here. Yes. Where would the people get the slaves? Well, most of the time slaves were bought, but sometimes slaves would have also been given in wills as gifts, and uh, they also would have been auctioned off as well. Yes. Well, students, those were wonderful questions, and I'm sure that you have many more that you want to ask. But now I'm going to give you the chance to meet someone who lived in the 18th century. Would you like to meet him? Yes. Okay, we're going to go to the slave cabin, and we're going to meet someone by the name of Slammin' Joe. So just follow me and we're going to head on up there. Well, good morning. Come right on in. Good morning. Good morning. Just come right on in. Come on, let's get in. How y'all doing this morning? Come on now. Good. Little Missy, how you doing? I takes the hand. Good morning. Good morning. Sir, good morning. Welcome to my home. Good morning, good morning darling. Y'all say good morning. Come on now. Say good morning. How y'all doing this morning? Good. Y'all know who I am? No. I'm Slammin' Joe. This is my home. I live here with my wife and six children. Six children. How old are you, Miss Smith? I'm 11. 11. My daughter, Penny, 11 years old. 11 years old, George Washington don't really have laborers in the fields until they're around 12. Now my two oldest, Sophia, Savory, they 13 and 14, they working. My son, Israel, he learning, he gonna be a tradesman. Two young'uns, they just run around through here tearing stuff up. Silla be going crazy with them, run around through here tearing stuff up. 
So welcome to my home. Any questions at all? Where do you get your food from? I get my food. I get some food from, from Jenna Washington. Jenna Washington gives me some food. They give me enough food to live on. Most of the food that I get, I get from right here. I grow my own stuff. Yes, ma'am. What's your job? I was a ditcher. Ditch is a very important job. There ain't that many ditches around here. That's why they call me Slamming Joe, because I don't just be digging, I be slamming. What does a ditcher do? I dig for the general, but you gotta dig right. You gotta have a ditch has to be the right height, and it gotta be the right width at the bottom. So you gotta know what you're doing. You can't just go out there and dig a hole and walk away. You gotta really know what you're doing. So I'm a tradesman. I ain't just no common labor. I'm a tradesman. What other jobs is there? Well, you take my Scylla. She's a field hand. That means she get up. From, she work from can't see to can't see. You know what that is? That sun up to sun down. She be out there in the fields. My boy, he 10. My boy, he apprenticing. For a job, he's gonna be a tradesman like his father. Other job would have been up in the home house. Some people work in the home house, stay inside. Most of us work outside. What would you have for dinner? Well, really, I'm gonna have anything that my wife Scylla fixed for me. Generally, though, we're gonna eat some fish, probably, and some vegetables. We might even have a little chicken. We don't know. Sometimes we only eat a lot of chicken because we need them chicken for them eggs. When General Washington, when he kills the hogs, he gives me some of that because I was a good worker. You got to be a good worker to get some hogs. Mm -hmm. Get some of the hogs. You got a question? Um, what were your clothes made out of? Well, this year, when I'm wearing here, this linen. Summertime, I wear linen. I get one linen pair of pants. I get two shirts. One shirt to wear, one shirt to wash. In the wintertime, I wear a woolen jacket, one woolen jacket, one wool pair of pants. I get one pair of shoes. I see you looking at them. They're a little dirty, but I keep them kind of clean most of the time. I don't wear them a lot. I get this. Scylla, Scylla, she get the same kind of clothes on. She get what? She get dresses instead of she getting pants. Okay, well, Slam and Joe, thank you so much for allowing us to visit with you today. Well, thank you for coming to my home. I don't really get a lot of visitors, so I really have enjoyed y'all in here today. Students, did you enjoy visiting with Slam and Joe? Yes. So let's give him a nice thank you. Thank you. You're so welcome, y'all. Come on back in and see me, all right? Okay. Joining me now to answer your questions are Charlene Williamson, a historic interpreter at George Washington's Mount Vernon Estate, who we just saw on the tape a few moments ago. Thanks for being here, Charlene. Thank you. And from the 18th century, Tom Davis, a member of the enslaved community at Mount Vernon. Tom was a laborer at the Mansion House Farm. At various times, he worked as a ditcher, bricklayer, fish net rigger, painter, paper hanger, grass cutter, and brick maker. He also hunted food for the Washington's table. And Tom, if General Washington entrusted you with a gun and gunpowder, you had to be a pretty good shot. Oh, yes, ma'am. I was a superb shot. Me and my dog, Gunner. Now, we go out there and go hunting every now and then, you know, and uh, you only get to shoot one time in about a minute or so. So, you know, you shoot and you miss. Well, chances are everything going to be gone. So you got to be a good shot. Well, we have a lot of questions for you and Charlene. They've been emailed in to us. Let's start our discussion with a question from Mrs. Silva's fourth grade class from Indian Brook Elementary School in Plymouth, Massachusetts. They would like to know how many slaves worked at the farms and what kind of jobs did they do? Charlene? Well, that's a very good question to start off with. We're very fortunate that George Washington was such a great record keeper. In 1799, he did a census of his enslaved population or a record. And from that, we've been able to know the names and the ages and even some of the jobs that some of the enslaved workers did here. Now, we know in 1799, George Washington had about 316 slaves that lived and worked here. Now, we know some of them worked in the fields, on the farms. Uh, you 
heard about, you heard from Slammy Joe that his wife's name was Scylla. Scylla would have worked in the fields as a field worker tending to the crops. There was also someone by the name of Ben. He was the miller. He worked at the grist mill. He did skilled labor here. Some of the other skilled labor would have been carpenters. Uh, they would have been brick makers, spinners and weavers as well. And there were also slaves who worked in the house and they would have taken care of the Washington family and their visitors. Well, we have a great studio audience with us today. Does anyone have a question? For, yes, go ahead. Yes, hi. My name is Muhammad. My question is, do you live on one of the farms? Oh, yes, sir. You see, I stay up on the mansion house farm. Now, I used to stay in the slave quarters with uh, all the single men. But uh, I got time to listen to those Negroes talk and fight all night. So now I stay with my sister Betty in her cabin. But we still on the mansion house farm. All right. Yes, sir. Another question from the audience. Oh, hi, my name is Chris. My question is, are you married and do you have any kids? Well, sir, I ain't married yet, but I got my eyes on somebody on another plantation, but uh, you a little young. I can't tell you about that right now. But, uh, you know, I got time, yes, sir, but uh, I've always wanted to start me a family, wasn't I? I had me a little boy running around here. Yes, sir. All right. Thank you, Tom Charlene. Right now, we're going to take a closer look at the farming practices of George Washington. Washington was a visionary who introduced many new ideas into the colonial system of agriculture. He took good care of the soil in which he grew his crops. He knew that healthy soil produced healthy plants. Here's how he did it. Back in Washington's day, most Virginia plantation owners grew tobacco as their main cash crop. In his early years as a farmer, Washington grew tobacco too. But when he saw that tobacco used up valuable nutrients in the soil, he replaced tobacco with wheat which was not as damaging to his soil. In caring for his soil, Washington also developed a clever way to rotate his crops. Many 18th century farmers already practiced a three-year crop rotation, planting their crops in different fields each year so that the soil would not become exhausted. But Washington practiced a seven-year crop rotation system he designed to improve his soil and crop production. Here's how it worked. No crop, except for grasses, was ever planted in the same field for more than one year in a row. When grasses were planted, sheep and other livestock were pastured in the field so that their manure would help to fertilize the soil. By rotating the crops and making sure that every field lay unplanted for at least one year, Washington kept his soil healthy. Soon he was growing over 60 different crops on his five Mount Vernon farms. Besides wheat, which he sold to make money, he grew many acres of corn for feeding his slaves, his livestock, and his family. Washington also experimented with using different soil enhancers or natural fertilizers to keep his soil healthy. He tried adding animal manure, creek mud, marl, fish heads, and green manure, which was buckwheat or clover grown in a field and then plowed back into the ground. Each of these enhancers contained organic nutrients that fed and improved the soil. Through careful experimentation and observation, Washington learned what worked best for his crops. Animals played an important role in farming at Mount Vernon. Along with oxen, horses, and mules, which were used to do heavy field work, Washington raised hogs and sheep for food and wool. No part of an animal went to waste. Besides giving milk, cattle provided meat, as well as leather to make shoes, saddles, harnesses, and other useful items. Chickens provided meat and eggs. And, as we've already learned, animal manure was used as fertilizer. Oxen are steers that are trained to work in fields. They are much stronger than a horse or mule and were used to haul logs, remove stumps, and pull plows and carts. Mules were important because they are strong and need to be fed and watered less often than horses. A mule's parents are a donkey and a horse. Washington thought very highly of mules. He bred them himself and urged other farmers to use them. Washington's hogs ran loose through the forests. In the fall, they were captured, penned, and fattened for slaughter. They provided the plantation with ham, bacon, sausage, chitterlings, and lard, as well as bristles for making toothbrushes. Fences also played an important role in farming at Mount Vernon. Washington used several kinds of fences, each with a different purpose. Small and movable hurdle fences were used to keep animals in an area for a short time to graze and manure the fields. Sturdy, permanent post and rail fences were used to mark boundary lines and to keep animals on or off the fields. Wattle fences, made of tightly woven branches, 
were used to pen chickens and other small animals and to keep hungry foxes away. Sturdy, easy to move rail or zigzag fences were used to enclose fields. Because of their flexible design, they could be laid around trees, rocks, and other obstacles. So, fences at Mount Vernon had two main purposes, keeping domestic animals in and keeping wild animals out. Fences protected domestic animals from getting lost, stolen, or attacked by predators, and also kept them in areas where the fields needed fertilizing with their manure. Fences also kept animals like deer and rabbits from eating crops, and foxes and mountain lions from attacking livestock. Besides soil, animals, and fences, good tools were essential to the success of Washington's farming operation. Fascinated with technology, Washington was always looking for new tools and methods. His most important invention was a 16-sided treading barn, which he designed to improve the threshing of wheat, the process that removes the wheat berry from the husk after the wheat has been harvested. Traditionally, this had been done out of doors, on the ground, by hand, using a tool called a flail. Among its other drawbacks, the flail method was dirty and labor-intensive. Washington's 16-sided barn was a great improvement. The barn had two levels, and the harvested wheat was laid out on the floor of the second level. The floor was made of wooden slats, with a gap of one and one-half inches between each slat. Horses and mules would trot around the barn, the weight of their hooves cracking open the wheat husks. Once separated from the husks, the wheat berries would fall through the slats to the level below, where they were gathered, cleaned, and sent to the mill to be ground into flour. George Washington's farming practices were meant to conserve and improve the land, and to make the most of all the resources he had at hand in order to increase the productivity of his farms. His vision for his country and his personal interests were connected. He believed it was his duty to find the most productive agricultural methods and to share his findings with small farmers who did not have the land and resources he had at Mount Vernon. We've had a lot of emails come in. Our first question about farming is from Mrs. Speed's fourth grade class at Juniper Elementary School in Bend, Oregon. They ask, why did George Washington think that wheat was better to grow than tobacco? Charlene, do you want to take that? Yes, that's a very good question. Tobacco was very, very hard on the soil. Soil gets tired just like people get tired, and just as we need rest, so does soil. Well, tobacco used up all of the nutrients and the vitamins in the soil and made it so unhealthy that it would take about 15 years for it to grow healthy crops again. Also, George Washington could only sell his tobacco to England. That was the law at that time. And the prices in England were set by people who set the prices low. George Washington and other farmers like him were not able to make a lot of money. Well, he thought wheat was a lot better. First of all, it didn't take a lot of people to grow the wheat crop. But then also, Washington found that he could just simply grind the, the grain from the wheat into flour, and he could have that sent anywhere in the world. Then also, he found that if he didn't sell all of this crop, he could store it at Mount Vernon and use it for his own purposes. Well, Mrs. Kleinstuber's fourth grade class at Lake Coma Elementary School in Orlando, Florida would like to know, how many treading barns did George Washington build at Mount Vernon, Charlene? Well, as you heard on the film, George Washington only had one treading barn built, and that was located at Doge Run, uh, Doge Run Farm. And that treading barn help to separate the grain from the wheat stalks. Now eventually technology caught up with George Washington and he was able to buy a mechanical wheat thresher which did the job just as well. Our students in the audience have several questions. The next question? Yes, go ahead. Uh, my name is Abraham and do you get any time off work? That's for you, Tom. Oh, sir. Well, we get one day off a week, sir. That's Sunday. Now, on Sunday, you can do what you like. You can go somewhere, go to another plantation, another farm, whatnot. And we got a preacher who come in. Now, he come in and he teach the word to everybody. Now, after he get done teaching the word, well, he teach those who want to how to read and write. Now, you got others who uh, play games, play music or whatnot. Now, me on my day off, well, I just eat and sleep. I'd be tired from working all week, so I don't do nothing but eat and sleep. Yes, sir. We have more questions from our in-studio audience. We have from Cassie. What's your question, hon? My question is, have you ever ran away? Well, now, ma'am, you see, uh, the eyes ain't never run away, you know, but you got some slaves who have. Now, you see, I ain't ran away because I ain't got no money or no land, so ain't nowhere for me to go. 
And I figure if I run away, well, I'm just going to have to keep on running. Because if somebody find me, well, they're going to try to make me a slave again. So I ain't never ran nowhere. No, ma'am. My name is Catherine. About how many hours a day did you work on the farm? Well, now, ma'am, you see, uh, an old fella told me one time that uh, we work till we can and till we can't. Till you can see the sun, till you can't see it no more. You see, I ain't got no time piece, so I can't tell you how many hours that is, but I sure enough tell you this. During certain parts of the year, it seems like forever, especially during the summertime. That sun don't never want to go down. Yeah, ma'am, all day sometimes. Well, an important part of Washington's estate was his mill. We're going to learn a little bit more about that right now. Many large plantations in 18th century Virginia had grist mills. Such mills ground wheat into flour and corn into meal to help feed the family, enslaved workers, and animals living and working on the plantations. But George Washington's grist mill was different. It was called a merchant mill because the flour and corn meal it produced were not only used at Mount Vernon, but also sold by the barrel to customers nearby and as far away as Europe. By selling his flour and corn meal, Washington was able to make more money from his farming business. A grist mill is a big machine that uses water for energy and runs using a system of gears and levers. The water for Washington's mill was stored in a pond about two miles away. To reach the mill, the water traveled downhill through a man-made canal called a mill race. From the race, the water entered a wooden box, or flume, which had a gate that the miller would open to release the water against a big wooden water wheel located inside the mill. Washington's mill had three floors. The water wheel was located on the first floor. It was 16 feet around and had 40 built-in buckets. The weight of the water in the buckets, which was over 3,000 pounds, assisted by gravity, caused the wheel to turn and power the mill machinery. But how did this actually work to grind grain and corn? A strong oak shaft connected the water wheel to the mill's main gear. As the water wheel turned, it caused the shaft to turn, which then turned the main gear. The main gear was connected to a series of smaller gears, which turned two pairs of millstones located on the mill's second floor. One pair of stones at Washington's mill ground wheat, and the other corn. Each stone had deep grooves cut into it to create a grinding surface. The lower stone of each pair did not move, while a top stone turned. The miller used a lever to control the distance between the top and bottom stones. How far apart the stones were determined whether the flour or meal would be finely or coarsely ground. The closer the stones were together during grinding, the finer the final product. Finer grade flour was sold for more money and earned George Washington a larger profit. The ground grain entered a chute leading to a shaker box located down on the first floor. The bottom of the shaker box had a wire screen through which the cornmeal or flour was sifted into a large bin to remove large pieces of waste. The waste was often used to feed animals. After sifting, cornmeal production was complete. However, two more steps remained in flour production. First, the flour was dried in a hopper boy. Then it passed to a bolter, which separated it into superfine, fine, or coarse grind by passing it through coarse, fine, and superfine meshed cloth screens. George Washington was always eager to use new technologies to help improve his business. In 1791, for example, he was one of the very first mill operators to install a labor-saving new Oliver Evans system at his grist mill. And in 1797, he opened a distillery next to the mill. Soon, the distillery was one of his most profitable business ventures. George Washington believed that the success of our nation depended on growing and shipping wheat, flour, and other agricultural products around the world. Here, at his mill and distillery, you can see how he worked to reach that goal. Our next question is from Mrs. Easter's third grade class, Church Street Elementary School in Tupelo, Mississippi. Where was George Washington's grist mill? Charlene. It's a very good question. As you saw on the film, George Washington had a grist mill that was located on Doe Run Farm, and that was located near Doe Run Creek. It was very important to have the water because that helped make the grist mill run, and he would use the water from the creek to help to transport by boat the flour that he had ground at the grist mill, and from there to the port in Alexandria, and then from there to different countries around the world. All right, another email question from Ms. Bud's fourth grade class, Dillard Street Elementary School 
Winter Garden, Florida asked. They asked, did George Washington's mill ever break down? Well, you know, the grist mill was a piece of machinery, and all machinery breaks down at some point. So George Washington had a, a big job in making sure that the grist mill ran properly. You know, the biggest part of the grist mill was the mill race, and that was the canal that ran from the water itself into the grist mill, making sure that the water ran smoothly. Now, someone like Slam and Joe, he would have been responsible for digging ditches to make sure that the water ran smoothly. Weather was always a problem as well. Sometimes if the weather was too cold, the water would freeze and the water wouldn't flow into the mill. And then there were other times when the weather was too hot and there wasn't enough rain. And then that would also present a problem because there wasn't enough water to run the mill. All right, Mrs. Downer's fifth grade class in Fremont Elementary in La Cañada, California wants to know, how much flour did George Washington's mill produce each year? Well, as we talked about before, George Washington was a wonderful record keeper. So, for example, in 1797, we know that George Washington's grist mill ground about 5,000 uh, bushels of wheat. So they think about that. That's about 275,000 bushels altogether. Now, he also, the mill also ground about 3,200 bushels of corn. And that was about 178,000 thousand pounds Ooh. of corn. So that's a lot of corn. That's a lot of corn. Mm -hmm. We have another question from our studio audience. Yes. Hi, my name is Shamia, and my question is, what was it like working for General Washington? <sighs> well, now, ma'am, that's a tough question now. You see, uh, it ain't easy. You see, any uh, part about slavery, ain't nothing easy about that. And uh, the general, well, he's a hard worker, and he got a lot of land. He trying to make some money with his land. So uh, things got to be done, whether you're injured, you're sick, or whatnot. It's a lot of work. You ain't got no say-so. You got to get up, work all day. Ain't nothing but work, 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 work. Now, the general's are hard work, and I respect that about him. And I can't blame him for it. But uh, it's difficult at times, man. It's very hard. Yes, it is. All right. Do we have another question from the audience? Yes. Hi, my name is Josephine. My question is, did you ever work at the mill? Well, now, ma'am, you see, uh, I did some ditching down at the mill. You see, uh, the ditching helped with the mill race. We had to build that. Now, uh, you see, that was pretty much the most work I did at the mill. But I met Ben the Miller when I was down there. You see, Ben, he's a slave here. And uh, you see, he's in charge of the mill. Ain't too many slaves in charge of anything, but he in charge of that mill. Yes, ma'am, you see, most of my work take care, take place up here on the mansion house farm, hunting, fishing, you know, like that. But the uh, only time I went to the mills for ditching. All right, well, we have a final email question now from Mrs. Morales' third grade class at the Buckley School in New York, New York. Why do you think George Washington liked farming? Charlene. Well, that's a very good question to wrap up with. I don't know if any of you know this, but 200 years ago, 90% of all Americans were farmers. So that meant that if you lived during that time, you probably would have been a farmer too. Now, George Washington, he loved to farm. He loved to experiment with new ideas, but he was also our nation's greatest leader. And he had a vision for America. He wanted America to be a storehouse and a granary for the world. He also wanted farming to be the way for America to become strong economically, selling our agricultural products to different countries around the world. So not only did he love to experiment and not only did he love farming, but he also felt that America would be strong if we relied on farming. All right. Mm -hmm. Well, if that's all the time we have for today, thank you, Charlene. Thank you, Tom. Now, thanks to all of the students, both here in the audience and around the country, who asked such interesting questions. From all of us here, thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.